Hey, welcome back. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. And if you're thinking you just saw me a second ago, you're right. I was just here a second ago, and I'm in the exact same stuff. Anyway, I thought I would just record two Bible study sessions back to back. I've got a very busy few days ahead of me, and I don't know what my timing will look like to get another session recorded. So, hey, you get me right back to back again. All right, let me go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and get started with prayer. Oh, uh, we're in Ruth. So open your Bibles to that. And we are in lesson one, day seven right now. So grab your Bible, grab your notes, and then let's get ready and um, start with a word of prayer again. Heavenly Father, we invite you once again to our time together right now. Thank you for the power of your word to remind us who you are. Help us be faithful in living lives that reflect truly that we believe who you are. And let that be true in how we live, how we speak, and how we uh, exemplify our faith in this world. Um, go before us now in our study time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's switch screens. And ta-da, there you go. Hi, get that up there. All right, so we're in lesson one, day seven. And as always, we begin with prayer and scripture memory. And we've been memorizing Psalm 42, just verses one through two this week. Hopefully that's not too big of a challenge. I know our brains are not as good at locking all this stuff in. We've got a lot on our mind, but hopefully by taking it two, uh, verses at a time over the next few weeks, we will get it memorized. Here we go. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 42. Well, let's go ahead and take a look back over here at our lesson. Naomi is a God's chosen is of God's chosen people, and yet she and her husband choose to reject his discipline, seeking instead to find a way, even in the midst uh, in the most forbidding of places, like a prodigal child running away from the protection and responsibilities of life with the father. The Elimelech family had attempted to run from God. Tragedy strikes, and we see God's hand of judgment against the family. But the story begins to turn, and the turning is a result of the kindness and loyalty of the most unlikely of people, a Moabite. Read Ruth 1, 6a, what news comes to Naomi's ears. And let's write out the verbs associated with what the Lord has done. Let's take a look at that over in Ruth 6, uh, 1, 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the, from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had given them food. So what has the Lord done? The Lord had visited his people and had given them food. This is the first time the name of God is mentioned in Ruth. Note that the, it is um, the Jehovah name of God. I am the I am name given to Moses from the burning bush when Moses asked God, who should I say is sending me to Pharaoh? This is his personal name of God that reminds us of his desire to have a relationship with us. As you read, it is interesting to understand what is recorded and what is done. It's interesting also, though, what is not said or done. Naomi hears that the Lord had given them food back home. What does this indicate that Naomi is interested in? What does this say about her priorities? She has heard that he has provided food. It says um, she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. What is she interested in? Well, she's interested in the food, of course. She's over here in a Moabite land. She figures, home, go back home. God's got food for me there. She's definitely interested in food. And who can blame her? She's in a fight or flight mode here in a sense. I mean, she's lost everything and is in dire straits. So she needs, she wants that food. I see that Naomi wants to return to the land for food, not for fellowship with God, though. Again, our priorities, like her deceased husbands, are off. Am I being harsh on Naomi? Well, consider the following. Let's take a look at Isaiah 55, 7. What's the plea of the prophet here? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundant, abundantly pardon. Who are we to return to? To God. Let us return to God. Note in your, note in your Bible that she could have said, I will return to my God, my God, my God, and pointing to him and, and returning to go seek him. But I don't see that here. I see her desire for food. And again, it's like, who can blame her? It's tough times. And she's hungry and she's starving and she's facing death, really, um, if she stays in Moab. 
What's the plea of the prophet here, though? To return to God. We're asked to return to a who and not a what. Return to God. Then you get the blessing of food and land and peace, etc. Naomi's decision to go back home was the right one, but her focus is wrong. I don't think this is a harsh assessment of Naomi. If she had the right motives, the book of the Bible might have been named Naomi instead of Ruth. But Ruth is the one who rises above and does the ultimate act. Naomi should have known better. Naomi was from the land of promise and the people of promise. She should have acted accordingly. Ruth 1, 6-7. Hope for Naomi. After hearing of the food she prepares to do, um, after hearing of the food, she prepares to do what and with whom. Here we go. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of, uh, of Judah. Through seven. Did I read through verse seven? Yeah, <laughs> through the land of Judah. All right. So she has her daughters ready to go, and she's going to head back to this land of Judah. Good job, Naomi. They prepare to return home from Moab. She's bringing her daughters-in-law to the promised land. Read Ruth 8, uh, 1, 8 through 9. A shift, a second thought. What does Naomi tell her daughters-in-law to do? But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. So what does she tell her daughters to do? Stay here. Stay in Moab. Remember, where is Moab? Uh, where is Naomi heading? Home. And not just any home. The home of the promised land. And to the people of the promise, where is she leaving? A cursed land and a cursed people. Why on earth would she insist that these two Moabite women should stay in this land of cursing? Why not keep them with her? Think about possible motivations Naomi might have in saying this and write your ideas there. I mean, was she concerned that they may not make, make the travel back? It really wasn't that far to go back. Um, was she concerned about what might happen to her daughters as she gets back to Judah? Um, she just want to be done with it and, and move on and go back home a widow and not have the embarrassment of having two widowed daughters with her without her husband and just compounding what the social pressures might be and what might be people might think of her. I don't know. I want you to write it down. Tell me what you think and, let, and share your thoughts here too. Read Ruth 11 through 1, 11 through 15. Summarize what takes place in these verses. So Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you come with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that made me go and that they may become your husbands? Turn back my daughters, go your way for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her and she said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods return after your sister-in-law. So summarizing this, she insists insists, insists, and lays out a crazy scenario. And what am I supposed to get pregnant right now? And that kid's going to end up being your husband, you know, crazy. And really insists that they go back. Reviewing Ruth 1, 8 and 11 through 12, how many times does um, Naomi urge Orpah and Ruth to return? Well, she urges them up in there in, in Ruth 8, and then again, twice more here in 11 and 12. Does this number seem significant? Three in insistences. Where else in scripture do we read of three urgings for the wrong thing? Hint, Matthew 26, 69 to 75. There is no direct correlation in the text to connect the account of Peter's three denials to Naomi's three urgings. However, I found it interesting. In fact, reread Matthew 26, 75 and note the word used to describe Peter's weeping. Keep that word in mind as we move on. So let's take a look at Matthew 26 and really um, focus in on that last verse there. Let me close this one down. Get some more room on my screen. Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and as a servant girl came up, and a servant girl came up to him and said, "You are with the Jesus the Galilean." But he denied it before them all, saying, "I do not know what you mean." And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, "This man was with Jesus of Nazareth." And again he denied it with an oath, "I do not know what you mean. I do not know the man." After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are 
um, uh, you two are one of for the, of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And, the, and he went out and he wept bitterly. What was that word there? Peter's weeping bitter. Keep that word in mind again, as we continue to read, it's really actually quite interesting. Naomi is clearly out of hope. Devastated by the losses she suffered, she has not kept her eyes on the God of promise. While she hears about what the I am has done for the land, she's not trusting what he could do in her life. I have shared in our previous studies of my own lack of hope that used to define my life. In a broken marriage to an abusive alcoholic husband, infertile and lonely, I had all but lost hope for me on a personal level in my own life. I knew of hope, God's hope, in the big picture. But for me personally, in the smallness of my little life, I was on the edge of despair. I will say this for Naomi, at least she's on the right road. The journey from Moab to Judah was about 60 miles, a two, maybe three day journey. At least she was heading in the right direction, albeit for wrong motives. Naomi is about to embark on a road that will take her from the land and experiences of despair to a land that will ultimately bring complete restoration. But she still needs an encounter and little does she know. But she's trying to let go of the very person who will be an instrument of restoration in her life. Wow. You know, I love this story. It's such an amazing account. And, uh, you know, Naomi is such a central and important figure for all of us to, to learn from and to test our own hearts and see where are we in our walk with God? Are we truly trusting God for God or are we trusting him for what we can get out of him and um, being okay with, with whatever he gives us, right? And so this is a fabulous reminder to me um, in my own season of life right now that I truly trust God um, no matter what is going on, that he is sovereign, that he has um, my best, but really his glory in mind. And uh, am I willing to uh, feel like I'm not getting the best in order for God to get the glory? And that, that's, a constant, um, that's a constant question for me. Am I really willing or really am I more in it for my glory and my comfort and my satisfaction? I hope that's a time, I hope that's a good um, thought for you as we close our time together right now and you think about that. Um, please leave a comment and let me know what you're thinking. And if you haven't already subscribed, um, do that today. Subscribe to our LMCC Women page or the YouTube or the Dwelling Richly podcast, whatever it is. Um, just hit that subscribe button so I know you're there and we can say hi and leave a comment. Let me know what you thought about today's lesson. And I look forward to seeing you at, at our next lesson. Uh, until then, know that you are loved and prayed for. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>